This next edition of the Value Exchange podcast with me, Annabelle Lambert, and my regular co host, uh, Rob Pye. Say hello, Rob Pye. Hi, both. Hi, Mark. Hi, Annabelle. Um, I am uh, extremely delighted to welcome to join us today uh, Mr. Mark Waters, who we met, uh, I think maybe we worked out four or five years ago uh, yeah. for the first time. Mark has spent uh, over 30 years across many uh, areas in the educational sector uh, and, and, and finds himself um, sort of building uh, collaborations between young people and employers to improve uh, the one's ability to transition really from education into employment and understanding more about what is employment and it's a very fast moving space as jobs are changing every minute of the day as we move forward so so i'm going to hand over to mark ask him to tell us a bit about himself uh, what he's about where he is and why he's doing what he's doing where he's uh, where his journey has uh, come from so mark over to you Hi. Um, good afternoon now. Yeah, thanks for inviting me after all these years. Yeah, nice, nice you're to be back welcome. and talking to you again. Um, yeah, so I'm a co-founder of a careers education charity called Forward Futures. So I, like Annabelle said, my background's probably 40 years ago now. Started working in education, um, initially as a teacher uh, in special schools, working with kids with emotional behavioural problems, then worked on lots of different um areas of special education but and then got involved in setting up and running projects and after i did a research-based masters at the institute of education in london looking at the experiences of apprentices who were incredibly successful in their apprenticeship but had had pretty horrendous times in their growing up so i did quite a lot of work at jamie old 15 program which was amazing I, you know when he i think he admitted it was the best thing he ever did when he was at this event um, where they took young people, the two people I met have been locked up since the age of 14, been involved in gangs, attempted murder, all that kind of thing. And I've been probably in education 25 years then. And that two hours sat in their restaurant in the basement of their, where they worked was revolutionary, changed my view on how I thought, what am I doing? And I'd spent many years trying to reintegrate young people from special schools back into mainstream schools, thinking that was the best thing to do. And it was just mind-blowing you know and the kind of things that came out of it and the way they talked about how being in an environment where they were valued where they were with normal people a bit mad because they're all chefs we all know it's a, it's, a, it's a weird wonderful environment no 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 disrespect to chefs but you have to, you have to be a, a certain character to be in there um and they talked about things like having self-imposed self-esteem and it was like well what's that about and it took us a while to unpick and it was basically I'm doing well because of me. I'm doing well in this environment and I'm being treated as a normal person and it's real what I'm doing. So when a chef punches me on the shoulder and says, well done for shelling four buckets of peas at five o'clock in the morning. And when that food, those peas go out, he might not value peas, but he'd worked on them for many hours. It was the best thing he'd ever seen and done. My, you my, know? And this guy, and this, I don't think I've ever interrupted this early on in an interview <laughs> ever, which, which is a good thing, by the way, because I can I right. interrupt when I get. So I want to ask how you, you it was mind blowing, you said, when you're sitting in a cafe talking to yeah. these two people. How did you relate it to your personal experience? What? How did you, why was I it? I think so because, good? right, the, the re one is because I'd spent 20 odd years in education trying to get kids come from special schools back into mainstream schools, thinking that was the best thing. Mm. Education was good. My own experience of education. So I failed my 11 plus when I was 11, went to a secondary modern school. Um, then all I ever wanted to do was go in the army for different reasons, family reasons, you know, what have you. So I had 16, two days after my last O level, I went in the army. After six weeks, realized I didn't want to do that because I didn't like killing people. No, obviously didn't realize that 15, 16, I was trying to kill people. Um, went to sixth form college, failed my A-levels the first time, got through that. Went into teaching, thought I was what to be a math teacher. First teaching practice, I stood there, thought this isn't for me. That night went to a special school, a therapeutic community, and met this whole group of young people who were very similar to some of the people I'd grown up with, very similar to me in a way. 
thought this is what I want to do. OK, but then I kind of fell back from kind of a really interesting way of working into mainstream education. And then the idea of doing the masters was to look at the provision we'd had for the past 25, no, since the 19, um, 1963 Newsom report, Half Our Futures, which was looking at what kind of provision can we have for young people who are not academic? Because at the time they didn't have much, you know, and then working with the apprentices. And I think it was, for me, it was amazing to, for the first interview I did, what really got home was this thing what i then started to develop in a phd at cambridge but I had to drop out because the funding is intrinsic capital you have a load of things about bodu is it i can never get his name right social capital um economic capital but this is intrinsic capital this is something that young person has inside them and kes the kestrel for a knave always was one of the most important films when i was young because again it's exactly the <laughs> exactly the kind of school i went to and grew up in and the fact that all right he nicked the book but the fact he stole the book but he taught himself and he shouldn't have pitched the kestrel lake all let's leave those that but he taught himself this kid who was a failure in school taught himself to do something that i would find really difficult so that's where i kind of i remember sitting in a, a special school one may i think may and a new head had come in and all this inspiration about carry on developing i thought i can't do this so i just left and I had, had some ideas of the project, ending up by chance going to Nosley Local Authority, meeting the chair of education, the, the head of education with an idea, it's exactly the same as Phil. So I turn up at places with a piece of A4, I've got this idea, and somehow I kind of sell it to people. And they loved it and ended up working there 14 years. You know, then got frustrated with that and left that and have an idea. And what came out of my master's was all the provision we'd had in the past 40 or 50 years was top down so you get people going oh we've got a problem with needs not in education we've got a problem with skills we've got a problem with so let's have a let's have a, a program let's have a project and i'd worked on one called the diploma program where labor were in for three years um which was a similar thing top down people sat in a dark room thinking up a new idea never looking back at what we've been doing over the past 50 years so and what struck me was you needed a bottom up you needed something that was done locally. So I set up a project in Crewe in Cheshire called The Pledge, which was um, a local collaborative partnership. So we got employers, the university, um, two colleges, some schools, and some, um, some parents, I think, sat around the table saying, what can we do in Crewe to help these young people? Because what had struck me with this, these two guys in the restaurant was it was that realistic experience you know it was it was it was just they were supported but there was pressure and there was expectation but there was also self-esteem you know and it meant something to succeed in that environment so it's it so that developed and then as i usually do i get frustrated or bored so i i left that and went with my piece of paper to phil you know because he wanted to do something i was in control of and phil's the same so phil's you know, 35 years he's worked at building Hadron Collider's particle accelerators. And he's worked in the middle of, you know, some of the world's biggest science projects. And his frustration, again, with education, with the way young people are being pigeonholed into, you know, certain things, certain academic qualifications, which do not prepare you for the world. All right, they show something. But when he's recruiting people, he's not looking at that. You know, so we, we're kindred spirits. We, we're different in personality and we get on really well, you know. And then so, yeah, so it, it was that my life experience of thinking that young people have an intrinsic capital. They've got something in there and education should be about recognizing that and helping them to build on that and helping them to value that and understand how important that is. Now, that was important 50 years ago, no, 40 years ago when I, you know, went out into the workplace, so to speak. It's incre incredibly important now because qualifications don't mean nothing. They give no indication of what a young people can do. And what they do is they drop sport, they drop theatre groups, they drop everything they love to sit in a room and pass an exam. And that's all they have. And they've lost all of that. And and that, and that in a way, is what we're trying to tap into. <clears throat> 
you know and we say we use things like metaphors like um, pro our project or our journeys of going to mars for example so we do loads of work with that where we take young people on a journey of why we're we going to mars how we're we going to get there what impact is that going to have on the human body then how can you build something on a planet millions of miles away so there are so many things there you can discuss and work on um pre-covid we had big practical events our last event before COVID was 10 days before the first lockdown when we had 115 year olds at Manchester University from five academies all building Mars environments working with engineers and that kind of thing and these videos on our website that was really incredibly successful then obviously COVID hit and it was like what are we going to do we could have closed but we survived and that opened up the world so I'm now working with architects from Beirut University people who just fly around the world working at MIT designing things um we bring them in on kind of virtual webinars virtual studios you know working with young people so that changed what we do but all the virtual environments we've created you know enrich the project all the technology just enriches the project is not the thing the real thing is going in <clears throat> into schools and we've worked recently this last year i was in yesterday actually in mole two tiny nanorick and nurkwis they've got 24 kids in the whole school so they got from year three, you've got, you've got seven year old, eight year olds to 11 year olds in one class, you know, live in a tranquil, beautiful, beautiful, perfect village. But their life experiences are really limited because that's all they see. To go into Northumberland in the middle of a housing estate that has 30 foot poles with t police cameras on every corner, you know, working in that kind of thing. So you've got the two extremes. So all of these kids, you know deserve us as adults to give them the experiences they need and the the self-awareness they need to be able to understand what they love what they can do because in 5 10 15 years time the world is gonna you know if you think of chat gtp you know which jason my colleague is doing loads of work on and it is awesome and scary at the same time mm. you know there's so much potential, but there's so much potential for change. And I was with a head yesterday in another school in Mould who wants us to do an AI project with uh, year sixes next year. And I'm like, that is really exciting and really scary. What the hell do we say to them? So we're going to work with her and some of the other people around, start thinking about that because these young people do need to understand it. You know, 10 year olds, especially 15 year olds and 18 year olds, you know, and understand how to use it and how it's going to, we don't know for exactly, you know, we don't know for definite how it's going to impact their futures, but we know it is going to have an impact and they need to be aware of, you know, the impact that's going to have, you know, so we do loads of work around space. Um, we do loads of work around sustainable, sustainable um, futures, which is, you know, and again, these are metaphors. These are metaphors to show young people that, I did a webinar series about just over two years, under two years ago for World Space Week, like returning to the moon, how NASA needs more than engineers and astronauts. If you talk to anyone about the space industry, it's an astronaut and engineer scientist, and they're a small part of the whole team. You know, you need creative. So we did a big project mm -hmm. 18 months ago with 14 college, FE colleges, um, young people doing game design, uh, VFX video and animation. And the Monday morning, we set them a challenge. We're going to Mars this you know so we had a couple of people on giving five minute webinar who work in the space industry <clears throat> we sent, set them a challenge of researching designing and creating a vfx video to promote a life on mars or a game design concepts about the challenges we face friday lunchtime 12 o'clock they all start presenting in there they never worked in teams before and this was still quite remote because it was the end of covid and my god what they came out was was mind-blowing from both sides they had no idea the importance of the skills they've got in creating. They played, you know, young people who play Minecraft and Fortnite, creating these 3D virtual environments. And I'm sorry, but we think we're clever sat here on a Zoom call or a <laughs> uh, whatever. And they were doing it pre previously, collaborating online in virtual environments, creating virtual assets, you know. So they had no idea that they could, they were, in massively in demand in the space industry. And then through that, we got to know this guy, Carl, and a few guys from Framestore, one of the world's biggest VFX film companies who do oh, 
and they do all the Marvel films, they do James Bond, they do all the virtual effects. And they build that all of that, a lot of that in a application called um Oh god, he's gone out of my head. Um <laughs> The package they use is what was developed for doing games, you know, and it'll come to me in a second, you know. So engineers are now using it. Filmmakers are using it, you know. So these young people are playing these games using these applications. Their transferable skills are massive, you know, and that's just one untapped. I think you know, also, so. Mark, our my learning, uh, well, having worked with some quite remote people you know we've been we're doing some work in somerset also in cornwall which is incredibly remote with our young leaders program and other things that we've been doing with them is sort of sort of raising the aspiration level as well the understanding that the virtual world that we now <coughs> live in yeah. this covid yeah. induced let's all get aligned because you know we've been online for 24 years and it's just yeah. <laughs> you know, so the world has now at least made a step to catch up with where we were with that and you know taking into account all the challenges it poses you know n not no end is right but the, the ability to raise aspiration and where people can get to um mm -hmm without having to actually move anywhere, you know, without yeah. having to go to London, without having no, to go to absolutely, New York. No, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it has such a potential for sort of transforming, you know, young people's, you know, what they think they can do and where they can yeah. get to. And we had this experience in with, with our Young Leaders Programme where we were able to work with, I don't know, 10, 15 mentors from Google. And Google, you know, when you're a young person, early 20s, it's like an aspirational organisation. Yeah. You know, it's where, yeah. where people, you know, want to engage. And um, we were they were able to connect with people they would never have, you know, Absolutely. dreamt yeah. they could yeah. connect with uh, during that period. <clears throat> So I, I'm sort of. We we've got a project. Like we've got a project called Eyes to the Sky, which I came up with, which was <clears throat> taking astronomers into primary schools. So we've done it in the northeast in Durham with Lorraine Coggill I'm from Durham University. We've done it in the northwest and North Wales. So in Durham, Lorraine was taking astronomers into schools with nine nine kids in the whole school. I've done it in Mould with the 23, 24 uh, Alex Hill, for example, and we were taking. And this is no, you know, professors and doctors of astronomy into these schools. And they, they, these people were incredible. They were so humble and talking about their backgrounds. And we took a kind of public engagement model rather than a lecture model. So basically you go in, we took them in and they talked about their life, their story, what they did, what they were interested in when they were their age, you know, and the journey they took. And we had one amazing young, um, Laura, Laura who was at Durham University, and she'd grown up, I live in Denby, North Wales, so she worked, lived in Plangochlan, just 20 minutes away, half an hour away. And she went to a small primary school in Wales. And she went into this school. We did a webinar that I took her into the, the two schools in Mould, the tiny ones. And she told them about how she went to a school exactly like this, and how she'd had problems with maths and English when she, was, uh, she had to have extra help. But then she'd always loved the stars. And then she realized, and someone had told her about how you can use maths to work out how far these stars are away. And that was it. So she's now just finished her master's at Durham and she's going to work for RAL Space. You know? So, so, it, so Mark, the, the, this brings me to the second interruption, which is um, <laughs> somebody said a couple of times to us, so I think it's a brilliant little um, uh, expression that, you know, it, it's not about often not about getting the kids work ready it's about getting the employers to be young person ready and, yeah. and the journey that certainly we're on the audience people watching today that the, the, well, in the future this podcast they're likely to not be young people as in you know yeah. they'll be 18 plus or 24 years plus old and um you, the story about go, taking astronomers in, into school is beautiful in that they got in touch with their stories about what yes. it was like when they were yeah. younger and yeah. how they had these shaping experiences. And what we're trying to, to help employees, people who are in the system, <clears throat> understand that, you know, that moment you had in the cafe in terms of alternative provision where it kind of, oh, my God, you know, it... Yeah. it it happened. Um, we've all got those stories. It's not, it, you know, 
that we're, we're often we, we're not in touch or we've lost touch with them. And therefore, rather, you know, we've got thousands of executives in the UK going into schools yeah. and preaching to young kids about you yeah. need to do this, go to Durham, get this degree, get this quality, you know, because that's what I did without actually relating to them as human beings. And, yeah. and it's that meaningful story. <clears throat> so for our viewers who are perhaps a little older than the, some of your audience, the young people, <laughs> um, how, can, how can you help? How, what advice do you have for employees about how they can be like the astronomers and get their stories think, that are relatable you know, to the young people? I think it's important to listen to young people about what their interests and values and passions are and then make them feel, make them value those, because that's what they can build on. You know, I did maths and physics and geometrical and engineering drawing A level, and I passed it the second time, but I just memorized it, you know? So I could have gone into the space industry. If I had to failed it the first time, I was offered two Cs at Leeds University to become a civil engineer. Absolute worst job I could ever have done, <laughs> right? So. But I didn't understand my own values, my own values about people, my own values about thinking you could help people do something. So teaching, maybe it wasn't the right, you know, mainstream teaching definitely wasn't right for me. But you've got to kind of allow them to talk about what, how they see the world, how they see themselves. And then our role is to help and guide them to understand the way the world they're going into. And then if you build on that and you give them a link between what their values are and what they they love to what they might want to do, they then see a reason to do the maths or do the yeah. physics. And, and our, our, if you just uh, say to them, if you, well, we've got a project called Create a Sustainable Life on Earth Through Chemical Sciences that I came up three o'clock one morning. I couldn't <laughs> sleep. And it was like there was some funding for the Royal Society of Chemistry for a project. So the idea was to take chemists into primary schools to talk about how are they working to help address some of the environmental challenges and that you know that and the idea is all i can remember of chemistry is the periodic table and bunsen burners flame and chemical equations yeah. with no idea <laughs> of why and what now if someone would have said to me right let's go out let's go to the manchester ship canal at the time it was red and stank yeah we're going to help we're going to sort this out through chemistry Let, let's do you know We've now got plastic pollution, which wasn't really as big as an issue in, when I was in the 60s. Um, but if someone would have said that to me there, I would go, wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty important. I'll, right, I can see what, right, I'll get on and learn that. And I'll try and remember it because I want to do that. Because that's where my values are. That's where my passion is. Instead of saying you've got to go through GCSE, A-level degree. And when you've got your degree, you'll be able to get a good job. You know, well, and they yeah. lose all of that, that kind of reason yeah. for doing it. And the whole thing, lots of work we've done is about the why. If you can get in, why, why should you do this? What is important about it? And, yeah, and why to you yeah. as well? Why to you? Yeah. Not anybody else, yeah. you know. No, why, why to them? Yeah. So yeah. you can go in and talk about what you did and, and you should get your, yeah, fine. That is part of the, but it bears no relation to their worldview. And it, you're just an older person who's done that. Great, that's fine. You Well, so what? You've got a big car and big house and, uh, you know, loads of money. And you do exciting things. That's not me. You know, yeah. so it's yeah. got to be about trying to link wh where, what their frame of reference, their worldview is, and how they can build on that. And then you value them as young people and I their think, skills yeah. and qualities. Mm -hmm. I think the other thread that I'm feeling very aligned with is the sort of permission to try and fail and then try yeah. again. And Rob, back to your point about, you know, employers being ready to accept that, you know, you know, it's it's seen, you know, if it's seen as a, you know, almost not criminals a bit strong, but, <clears throat> but not great if you've job hopped, you know, around. And I, I just feel yeah. that that is people just finding their way with what they're <clears throat> doing. So, you know, I, I feel I want to support anybody who, you know, you talk about your story, Mark, and you're like, I hated that, I moved on, I hated that, I moved on. And that's just a process that you're going through. It does not make you a bad person. It does no, not make no. you a bad employee. It, it's just you, underst you understand yourself better probably than most people are even considering themselves. So, and I, um, 
I always, you know, tell the story that if there's more than one of me in a team, it'd be a terrible team, <laughs> you know. But then I come up with ideas that I've not. I think 1997 is the last time I had an interview for a job. So since then, I've just lived off my own wits, really. And it's been difficult at times. I just go back to failing. You, you, the thing. I can remember when I um, went to Manchester Poly. I did some school of education to be trained as a primary school teacher. The first assignment I handed in, um, under, I pushed it under the door and it was the wrong person. It wasn't the, the person I thought it was. Then I got hauled up in front of a board, a review board, and they were going to kick me off the course because my handwriting and spelling was so bad. And my the way I spoke was not appropriate for teaching. So I, my sulfur accent was too broad. So I had to have six months of elocution lessons <laughs> and spelling lessons. Right? I was 19. How old was I? 19, nearly 20. Oh, and and I got a first in English by the second year because I thought, you effers, you're not <laughs> Motivation doing this to me. <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, it, yeah, it's the value system we have, I think, doesn't, you know, and I know the way Phil works with his apprentices. He tries to meet them when they're 15. Now, this is these apprentices were going to work on building particle accelerators and some if it and he's got his old series of assessments and practical activities and this was numeracy. If they can pass that before they do their GCSEs, he can employ them. Once they've done the GCSE, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but once they've passed, taken them, if they don't get, I think it's a level four or what have you in English, they can't get on the apprenticeship program. You know, and it's like you've got these artificial barriers, yeah. and the whole thing of STEM, you know, is just like. Like Phil will say, he was a musician before he was a, an engineer, you know, and STEM shuts out so many people, you know. You've got things like the space industry that needs designers. It needs people. The, the, I got to know a NASA scientist who went, was involved in the launch, some of the Blue Origin launches, these Steve Bezos's, and he went to the launch site. He was sending something up into space. And the woman who runs his whole space centre, the launch, the development, the training is a an American Olympic athlete. Because she said, he said she was the most organized person, scary person, but most organized person he'd ever met. You know, so you need someone like that to run, bring all of those people together. And if you think now we're going, you know, and we had, we did a workshop in uh, Wallasey, a family workshop, which was scary, three one hours, 20 odd people a time booking in, families from four-year-olds up to 10-year-olds. with a, And this kid did this di diagram of a Mars um, habitat um, kind of cross-section, and it had a little dome, and the top bit had a beanbag and a TV screen or a monitor. And we said, what's that? Well, that's the chill-out room where they're going to relax. And below, we got therapy centre. This was a seven-year-old. Wow. And he said, well, it's going to be very difficult going to Mars, and people are going to lose the fam leave the families, might not know where they're going to come back, so they're going to need help with their mental health. And I was just like, and his mum sat there and just went, where did that come from? Amazing. You know, now that kid can see that and think that, but you then put him in a classroom or put him in a, in a, a hall and he's got to write an essay for two hours. Is that any way of judging whether that kid could go and work in the space industry? And he might not see himself as STEM. So you've got this big banner, STEM only. You know, it's, um, yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. So, we, we've got a, a friend who works for NASA. His job is as a, a storyteller. And yeah, he's a he's brilliant. A, yeah, he he writes future stories. He's a yes. writer who writes future stories because they want to envisage, you know, he's a sci fi author, you know, right? Yeah, well, Star, Star Trek was the classic right. one that they used to go to Star Trek, I heard, <laughs> for ideas. You know, and you think of all the things like the communicating device, yeah, the hologram. Yeah, yeah they exist. Yeah. You know, all of these things are here now. It's all there. It's yeah, like, it's all there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the whole thing of because we got a, the project we got visualizing a life on Mars. So they use stories, poetry, drawings, paintings on there. So we bring people on. David A. Hardy, we've had on a webinar. So he's about eighty odd now, and he works since the fifties with Patrick Moore. He did all of the original, some of the iconic space visualizations you know and we get to show them that these are really important you know it, the fact yeah nasa 
you need that they need to think about the future and we did a project i took about about six years ago a group of six formers to siemens in congleton and the head of r d there said look siemens obviously love engineers and scientists but we really love creatives and we really love disruptors and we'll try and make sure that in any team for a project we'll have at least one person who doesn't know what's going on because <laughs> they will ask the most important questions of why are you doing it like have you not thought and if you think of our phones you know i don't know if it's steve jobs but you know he got he's got the credit for it you know <laughs> if we would have left engineers and scientists working on our phones we would have had better phone calls we wouldn't have had video, we wouldn't have had TV, we wouldn't have had, um, you know, um, sat nav navigation and all, you know, being able to pay for things. We wouldn't have had, now, whether that's a good thing or not, you could say that's changed society and we should ban it all. It is what but it is. Yeah. Those <laughs> things wouldn't have happened without someone sitting there going, why can't we put a video screen? Why can't we have a TV screen? Why can't we, you know, that kind of stuff. It's... Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm kind of, and it does come from growing up. It does come from, you know, at times not feeling valued for the person I was and hating myself for it because you think you're judged by these people around you, whether you can sit down and write an essay or, you know, remember some chemical formula or mathematical formula, or whether the way you speak, the fact you can't spell very well, you're judged and that, you know, it's, but it's, so what we try and do and it's, is talk to young people and but take not me you know but take people in who can talk to young people and these people will go wow you're actually listening to me wow you're actually valuing what i say you know i have an opinion i've heard this and we took a like alex into the two primary schools nanook and necris and we were supposed to be there for half an hour we thought yeah, half an hour and a half he was there and they had so many questions but it wasn't just it was ideas they i've heard this my mum said this do you think? And one little girl asked Laura, she, this girl was only seven, what would happen if two galaxies collided? <laughs> I was like, where the oh my God. hell did that come from? <laughs> and she really struck, she was like, oh, well, you can see a bat chucking. Oh, well, you know. You know. <laughs> but, you know, for them to say that and feel valued, and we've got one classic, and we, also, we, we couldn't record it because of safeguarding, but there's a guy called, I think it was Aaron, who was in Durham. And he lived, he went to this school that was in this challenging area, you know, um, and we just put him in this virtual studio and we set up a virtual studio with a green screen and it was a deep space. And he just sat there, started interviewing his two friends, sat down as if they'd come, just got back from Mars. And then we brought one of the professors in and he interviewed her. Then we had people coming in on Zoom calls and he was talking between the three. And then in the final presentation workshop that we had online, he just came up to the camera and said, I'm going to go to Durham University, I'm going to do astrophysics. Thank you, bye. And then he put that in his feedback and he was talking to him. Now, he might never do that, but the fact that he thinks he could do it, the fact that he thought by talking to these people who were there and they were talking to him back as, as an equal, you know, not as a child, as a person, person to person, mm -hmm. the impact, hopefully, the impact on that will stay with him. And he will think, whatever he goes through, that, that experience you know, can have an impact in his future. And I think, is it Danny Boyle? The guy who was, um, I remember watching this with my dad when I was a kid. He was, um, no, that might be the uh, the writer. It was a, a kind of uh, Glaswegian gangster who was well known for cutting people in the face and slashing people. And he was in a secure unit. And he ended up being a, a social worker and a journalist after. And they talked to him about what was the turning point. Well, one of the, he got a parcel I don't know where this come from, right? Parcel and had string on. And the, and the one of the warders gave him a pair of scissors to open it. And he said, you know who I am? He went, yeah. So why do that as well? I trust you. And wow. he said that turned his, his view around. I'm, a, you know, convoluting the story a little yeah. bit. But again, with the kind of Kes thing and that kind of thing, it's those, yeah, those things stay with you. And, and like you said, you probably know, you create your value system. And what's important so um yeah in our so little what, way we're what, trying to what's do that. coming what's coming up of excitement what what um, um what's your most you know or what we would just you like? we just had an ew we'll wait to see if we've got funding to expand our astronomy project to go across the northeast northwest north wales and south wales you know so um and 
working with someone called Emma Wade from Astro Cymru in South Wales in the valleys, who's amazing. Um, Lorraine and Julie up in the northeast and us in the northwest, so that'd be good. Um, we're working on we're actually working on a space junk game, so that was really exciting, actually. But using a game as a way of showing young people about careers, um, and I think the sustainability side of it, we want to develop that more. I'm working with a guy called Samer, Professor Samer, uh, from Beirut University, and my virtual friend, another virtual friend, Eric, who just flies around the world, and we're looking at developing a project called Creating a Sustainable Town. So which from about eight year olds up to god knows 18 year olds and the whole idea because what came from the uh, one of the projects was a create a sustainable life on earth through chemical sciences where we tried to work with chemists was we turned it on its head because we struggled recruiting them and we talked to young people about the impact of what they do what they wear and what they eat has on the environment and that was amazing and um, we had kids uh the school i was at yesterday that i went into where they did a kind of sustainable fashion show and all the clothes were made out of plastic bags and waste and all of that kind of thing. Um, so we want to do more work on that. You know, we want to do some work around AI and thinking about how that's going to have an impact. But again, it's such a, that's challenging, exciting and challenging because it's such a, what do you say? You can, I've been reading a really good book at the moment, um, Scary Smart, which takes you on both journeys. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. like, whoa, this is what he can do. And then and Elon Musk is now going to set up a new AI company to good AI. You know. Yeah, I, I, I read Scary Smart. It's a great it's a great book. And yeah. I'm a tech. I'm a tech myself. So it, it's right. Uh, well, I'm not. We talk, right? Yeah, but it's subject. But yeah, we so we've, got, we've got these about, projects right? and um, I actually want to enjoy living as well. So oh, don't forget that bit. Of, <laughs> Because I live, I wear, cause like four years ago, next, this week, this weekend, we moved to Wales. So I live in Denby, North Wales. So oh, we're yeah. the castle. So I walk out and the castle's in front of us. So I could take the dogs down the hills. And it is postman Patland. It is just mind blowing. So, yeah. And I think. I remember, I remember Denby. We, we, well, are you, are uh, you must, go on. Our co founder of Ethos, Tony Clark, he lives on the north coast of uh, Wales or close to the yeah. north coast. And uh, yeah. no, I, I, I can't remember why I was in Denby, but it was about working with a the council there, I think, years ago. Okay. It, you know, so long ago I've forgotten. But lovely. I just remember, you know, and, and Wales is beautiful for nature no, it's and walking and greenery. And we, although it always we rains used to, in we used north to go Wales, to mid and, sat, mid and West Wales to stay in cottages and then. Mm. Because we lived in Manchester, yeah. Crew, what have you. And I used to go climbing with friends in Snowden or help them climb because I wasn't much of a climber. <laughs> but it was like we just, yeah, Vanessa took me on a journey four year, four, five, four and a half years ago. Little mystery trip and we ended up here. And it was just like, oh. And you must know when you do your own thing, when you, you value it and it's important to you, it takes over. And you can easily burn yourself out and end up in God knows where if you don't. So that's, yeah, that's my biggest mission now is to balance things better so things that are really important you've got to get a grip and i say i was talking to this head yesterday i said all i do is organize workshops for kids in schools i'm not a doctor i'm not a pilot i'm not a head teacher with the, you know hundreds of kids that i'm me and jason and phil doing somewhere and if some, somebody doesn't like it fine you know you, you can't please everyone all the time i try to and i take it really personally you know, so yeah, I can't. I've got to learn. You know, getting into my late so, years, got to learn. So to... my um my hypothetical work question is: I'm an employer. I love listening to this. Uh, you know, I want to I want to design my work better for kids. I love everything you said. I, I might I might not be into space as an employer. I might be. I might not be. But I, you know, I, I want to. I want to spend some time in schools, but I don't want to lecture to them about how to write CVs. I want to engage with them and listen to them, as as you said, and and then to help. I want. I want to get them to help me design better work. Uh, right. I think better jobs. You've got, how do I do that? You know? Off the top of my head, talking to them about what's important to them and what their worldview is, and then talking to them about how valuable and important that is and how this and bringing together what as an employer 
what you know forget qualifications tick some boxes i know that one but what is it you really want what is it you really value innovation ideas right, if you want someone who's going to turn up nine to five and sit there and do a job without thinking fine but actually you want someone who's going to come and be part of your organization part of whatever you're trying to develop especially if you're a small sme or even big ones you know what is it what qualities and what characters are you looking for that you want to come in and work with you and build and how can you make someone value and feel part of what you're doing because that is the only way they're going to contribute so you talk to young people about examples of what they're interested in what they do and then right so how from playing football how from being a musician how from i think of the day i completely forgot my, you know, my sister bred and and raised two horses she had a horse at the back of the house in the field it's like wow that's like 17 doing that so that's a commitment that how, is that's yeah, a serious so commitment. That kind of commitment and and passion but you know and then through that you can have conversations about the other things that are important you know that are going to help them get to where they want to be you know so but you're not going to they're not going to most of them will not do what you tell them to do they'll do what they want to do but you've got to kind of show them how building on what their intrinsic capital they've got how valuable that is and being able to articulate that and be confident about it you know so you sit in an interview you go right okay well school yeah okay let's wasn't great but let me tell you about this let me tell you how i set this up you know, so I've just been on a call just now with this Emma Hollins, who's um, first spoke, I have to be careful, first spoke to her when she was 16. I always first met her when she was 16, right? And she was setting up this um, aerospace for all with somebody else. Another, another, she was 15. She was doing that to do outreach to kids in school about space, you know? And she was just unbelievable. And you would give her a job now that you would say, right, forget school, just come and work with me because she had that passion and that energy. She's just now doing a master's uh, in physics at Exeter. <clears throat> and she's kept that. You just understand what I mean? But you could see that at 15 because she was, you know, and you have people in school who are prefects and do things, people who contribute to the society. Those are the people you want to employ because those skills you, you can't train. You can teach them the kind of things and all right if you go and work with phil you do yeah i was there there's a big open day monday tuesday and saturday um, at daresbury lab so getting an idea of what goes on there you do need certain skills and qualities to, be, to do that kind of thing but underpinning it you've got to have the passion and the energy you know and um and i think it's employers need to share and tell young people about all the different jobs that are involved in their industries you know and forget the word stem just open it up <laughs> because that will just shut them off you know it's you know the, the role of technicians where i think who was it i was talking to um we're doing a thing with carbon neutral labs in nottingham we just built them a virtual tour and we're talking to the professor who's the director they're they're looking they're trying to recruit 25 technicians or 12 Phil needs 25, you know, for the projects they do. So you've got all the doctors and the professors and the, you know, but they need the apprentices and they need technicians and technicians are vital and they're totally undervalued, you know? So employers need to kind of change the way they should tell young people about the roles, the different jobs and how important they are, you know? Wonderful. I'm very inspired. I'm sure everybody watching will be inspired. Yeah, can't fail to be. Mark, I'm conscious of the time. We are nearly 45 yep. minutes in. So yep. um, I'm uh, keen to uh, bring us to a close. Um, okay. But I guess I always, well, my last question is always, how can anybody help? You know, is there anything, anything, anybody? Ha have a look do? at our website, which is forwardfutures.org.uk. Number four, mm -hmm. WAA. We'll put teachers. some information in there. Yeah, and the just see what we do and get in touch. Mm. Yeah, it's because oh. um, as well as people who work, yeah, in space, in all space, in sustainability, you know, a part, yeah, part of the Sustainable Futures projects are about 
through any career you can help work on environmental and sustainability and biodiversity challenges whether you're an architect whether you're a designer a fashion designer a lawyer a farmer all all of these mm. we'd love to kind of talk to people about whether they are or how they could be and we always do things in schools about saying to kids tell us a job right and i will try and create a role hairdressers you know if hairdressers use more environmentally friendly shampoos um deodorant and um conditioners hair dyes you know products is the word they use products. Yeah. you think across the world across the country and the world what impact would that have <clears throat> okay amazing there you go thank you so much mark for your time rob Pleasure. anything you want to say before we close no just just thank you a brilliant brilliant interview and thank you for sharing what a wonderful story yeah fantastic and, um, keep up the good work yeah indeed thanks thank mark. You. i'll try thanks, my, i'll mark. try my best <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.